Beatles tribute band, the Fab Four, was founded in 1997. They have toured around the world and will be coming to Indian Ranch 200 Gore Road in Webster, Massachusetts on Saturday, August 23rd. The group covers the entire Beatles songbook. To get tickets to this performance, visit IndianRanch.com and for more on the Fab Four, visit TheFabFour.com. I have the honor of speaking with Fab Four founder and John Lennon of the group, Ron McNeil. Hi, Ron. How are you doing? I'm doing great. What's happening over there? Good. It's great to talk to you. <laughs> it's great to talk to you. Now, the group was founded in 1997. Now, in just a few years, you'll be celebrating 20 years as a tribute band. I know. That's scary. That's actually longer than the Beatles were together. I know. In all of their phases. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. They went through all of that stuff within like about a decade or so. Now I know it's about 50 years since the Beatles started. Yeah, that's right. 1964, America got their first glimpse of the lads coming over here. It was a big deal. Of course, none of us in the band are old enough to remember that, but we're an example of what happens when great music hits the planet. We're, I guess, byproducts of the ripple effect of that event. The band is just legendary. They are, and it still goes on. We're still talking about it 50 years later to the point where, like you said, we've had a successful business for 20 years. It really is amazing that that music touches everyone. Did you ever expect that the Fab Four would become what it would be today, or was it kind of like fly by the seat of your pants sort of thing idea that you came up with? <laughs> See how long it lasts. Well, yeah, at first you don't expect things to last as long as they did. I met Artie who plays Paul McCartney here in L.A. And we started off as wanting to put together a good, loving, respectful tribute to the band that we loved. We played local clubs, and then we got a call to go to Vegas, and I think that's where kind of our show started to become more of just exactly that, more of a show and more of a polished thing rather than just a bunch of guys playing their favorite songs. And then eventually it's grown into something where um, we've won an Emmy for our television special for PBS that we did, and we've worked with uh, Robert Zemeckis on a film, and we're the actual motion capture for a rock band. So if you have the Beatles rock band in your house, that's our movements. Wow. Uh, we've done all kinds of crazy things and, you know, been all around the world playing the greatest music of all time. It's certainly the best job in the world to have. That's what I call it. Well, what I really wanted to ask you, and I read that you play the entire Beatles songbook. That must be quite a challenge. Yeah, not all at once, or not all no. at once. Obviously, <laughs> yes. But at separate times, yeah, we have played probably just about all of them. We've played a lot of them. It just depends on what's going on, but our show that we generally travel around with and the show that we'll be playing in uh, Massachusetts will be our hit-oriented show. Yeah, they had so much material when you think about it. Like you said, it's only 10 years that they were together, but together so much great music. There really isn't a bad track on an album. And learning the entire songbook must have been a journey for you all. Well, it is. In the early Beatle years, when they were playing just two guitars, a bass, and drums, it's not that difficult to pick out what they were doing and try to learn those parts. But as their career progressed, they started using all kinds of different things, orchestral instruments and some sitars and things that are difficult to learn and to perform as a four-piece, which we are one of the only four-piece groups in the world that performs everything live. Most other groups will have a fifth Beatle or they'll be performing. It's very, oh, yeah. very popular nowadays to perform with a, some kind of backing track, which has some parts that the band can't play or most of the time some kind of vocals on there that they can't sing that well live on stage but we do it all live all completely 100 percent live on stage so like you said it was a little difficult to arrange some of those songs that were you know have a trumpet solo or <laughs> you know all yeah. strings eleanor rigby and some different things like that so it's been a challenge but it's been a, a welcome one for sure see i absolutely love that because in a way even though you're being a little easier on the band by having a backing track. In some ways, it just seems like cheating just a little bit. Definitely. And the 60s and the Beatles, that was a time when things were very organic. If you weren't true to the music, you were being fake. Things go wrong, and I think it's actually more embarrassing if something goes wrong with the tape than it is if something goes wrong on stage. You know, people are, are forgiving if I break a string or something happens and you start the song again. It's a live show. We always say that. So you never know what's going to happen. I wanted to ask you about the founding of the group. Did you just get a group of people together 
for this or was there an audition process? Did you feel like you looked a lot like John Lennon that you were going to have him? And I'm sure there's got to be a little bit of pressure to depict such a character. I went to a local Beatles convention here in Los Angeles and as part of the Beatles convention, I've always been a musician, but I was there as a fan of the Beatles watching Beatles films and buying Beatles t-shirts and part of that convention they have a sound alike contest. Do you sound like one of the Beatles? Artie was up there with his band, just as it's an amateur contest, and he was singing a song by Paul McCartney. I just could not believe it. I, I thought it was some kind of weird trick or something. This guy sounded exactly like Paul McCartney. Not looking too far off of Paul McCartney, but not looking exactly like him or anything like that. But we got together a couple of years later and decided to form it. As far as myself choosing John Lennon, I do play you know a little bit of bass. I play a lot of keyboards. And I do a lot of different things. But Artie had decided to play Paul and go left-handed for the show. Paul McCartney's left-handed, and I'm right-handed. And so okay. He, so it's Artie. Artie's right-handed, too. <laughs> when, he, when he made that decision, I'm like, okay, we got Paul. <laughs> that's I'm wild. Not, I'm not doing that. You know, that's dedication. Because I do a lot of different imitations. My teachers and my parents and, and the Beatles and the Monkees and everybody else and whoever else was in front of me, my vocal imitation of John Lennon was pretty good, and I thought that would suit me better. My face kind of lends itself more to John than any of the other Beatles. So and with a little bit of makeup, it all helps. Now you've talked about performing in Vegas. What was that like for you and how is it different than touring around the country and you've traveled actually around the world since the yeah, founding? we've been all over the place. Well, at first it was just a call. There was an act that couldn't perform so we got in there for a week or two and did our thing and left. And then they liked us so much they had us back again. And then we performed there at the Las Vegas Hilton for a couple of years and then we moved to what used to be the Aladdin. We played there for a couple of years. Since then, we just learned it's probably better just to go travel around and take the show all around. It was an interesting experience. One thing it did for us, I think, it helped us to polish the show. We're grateful for that. Now, you mentioned um, winning an Emmy. It's our television show. We filmed something for public TV, which generally plays on most PBS television stations across the country. Yeah, we won an Emmy for that. We're, we're very proud of it. it. It airs as part of PBS's pledge drives, and then people will get tickets to our show as part of the pledge. Sacramento is having another PBS pledge and a couple other different places. But I understand you also have the Fab Four, The Ultimate Tribute, that TV special soundtrack as well? You can buy that online, which is we're very proud of as well. People have been asking us all the time, where can I buy a CD of your show? The time before, we would just say, well, just go buy Abbey Road. Go to, <laughs> go to iTunes and buy Sgt. Pepper. You know, They want to hear how we do it, so we're real happy to have a recorded live show that people can purchase. But that must be ridiculously flattering, don't you think? Yeah. Well, like I said, for years we didn't even have anything. We're just like, why would you buy us playing the Beatles? Why not just buy the Beatles? But I think there's that kind of curiosity factor. How close can it sound? And a lot of times people want to take something home from the show to remember how we do it or the show as we perform it. You know, after a while, we gave in. <laughs> so, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned that at Indian Ranch you'll be performing the hits. That's correct, yeah. Basically our show starts with what people remember 50 years ago, the Ed Sullivan Show. We have a gentleman who comes out and performs as Ed Sullivan. He's Jerry Hoban. He performed as Ed Sullivan in the motion picture Pulp Fiction, if you remember that scene in the club. And so we're excited to have him on as well. And then we go through all the changes that the Beatles did. You know, their psychedelic years and then into Abbey Road when they were splitting up. Take the audience through the 60s. And I noticed on the Fab Four website that you take requests. Now, do you take requests when you're at the concert? We do take requests. Our show is pretty formatted, but, you know, every once in a while, if somebody has something, a special anniversary or something that they want to hear or a certain song that means something to them. I mean, let's face it, everybody has a, a personal story with one Beatles song or another. For the most part, people request pretty much the hits as well, or something that we do know, or something that we can pull out. No, it's exciting, and I do think I've seen you before when you first got started. It was excellent performance. You know, it expands generations. It does, and it's one of the great things we like to see. People who grew up with the Beatles and their kids and their kids. It bridges generations and all races and creeds. It's really amazing that music, like I said, everybody on the planet has some kind of connection to a Beatles song or a Beatles moment or an album. 
it really is a great honor to be up there helping them relive their own memories in a way. What I found interesting about the Fab Four is that you pay tribute to the Beatles, but I believe you also parodied them through Ruttlemania in 2007. Is That's that right. correct? And you did your, uh, your research for sure. Oh, I, well, I was fascinated because I'm like, how did you talk to Eric Idle from Monty Python? I think it's so fantastic that you be willing to also parody yourself and do a wonderful tribute, too. Being here in L.A., we get calls from a lot of different celebrities. We performed at Dave Grohl's wedding. We also played for Paul Stanley from KISS. We played his 50th birthday party, which was also a blast. You know, and everybody was there, Gene Simmons and everybody. So Eric Idle had called us to do his wedding anniversary, and that was a lot of fun. We thought, just as the Beatles, it would be fun to perform a couple Ruddles songs, so that's what we did. And, and he called us on the anniversary of the Ruddles to say, hey, I've got this idea to put the show together, kind of spoofing Beatlemania and calling it Ruddlemania. Would you guys mind being the Ruddles for a little while? That was a blast. He was great to work with. He was so creative and just on the spot. It's great to see somebody working just right off the top of their head and making the show great. We played three weeks here in L.A. We played three weeks in New York. It was just a blast. You know, getting to meet one of the Pythons and working with those people was, was amazing. Monty Python is just so wild anyway. I can't imagine what the kind of humor that went along with doing that kind of a show. He was so clever, and we never would have been able to come up with anything like that. And my name is Ron, and I got to play Ron Nasty, so that was fun, too. The Beatles were such an impact, like I said, that the ripples just keep affecting all around the world. It just keeps going and going. What are your future plans with the Fab Four? Well, we have a couple of projects. We have an, another, a new CD project we're working on right now. I just got back from the studio last night. I'm going again today. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic show on the 23rd. It's been wonderful to talk to you today. It's been great to talk to you and remind everyone, bring the family. It's a family show and bring everybody who likes the Beatles. We're looking forward to seeing you out there. I'm Jean